Welcome, everyone. This is Actionable Lessons from the Call for Testing Lab, a tour of the hardware methodologies and results, key point there, of the Call for Testing Lab. My name is Michael Dexter, and you've probably bumped into me at an event or two. Question, are you in the right room? I guess there's a parallel talk. Uh, you may vote with your feet at any time. You can interrupt me with questions, and I'll be watching the chat. And these slides to this are at callfortesting.org slash log. And I will put that in the chat for right now, unless someone wants to just beat me to it. Uh, oh, it doesn't let me type. Oh, there it goes, okay. Call for testing. Uh, log. And so uh, this will move quickly. So you'll probably want to jump into that if you want to follow along, because there will be tech code examples, et cetera. So the uh, menu this morning, which it's morning over here, it's evening over there. You are maybe getting tired, but hey, hopefully this will wake you right up. Thank you, your OBSD con, a bit about motivations, a brief blah, blah, blah about blah, 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 actionable hardware lessons, actionable software lessons, and going down a rabbit hole. And again, thank you, your OBSD con. So. Big thank you, because this was all very unexpected. In about 2001, I moved to Latvia. I was leaving Oregon burned by RPM hell when it comes to technology. I discovered FreeBSD jails. And in Latvia, with the help of Petrus Dunyashkins, I set up cvs.free.net and .openbsd because the internet situation in Latvia was pretty much an island. International traffic was extremely difficult to obtain and expensive, whereas local traffic was literally a LAN across the big cities. So come 2006, I attended EuroBSDCon Milan, come Copenhagen, and then Kristaps Johnson said, hey, uh, go, why, why don't you give a talk? And I'm like, Ah, oh, that's terrifying. Okay, I'll try. And so from there, if I click the next button, and Paldi is Christophs, Paldi is uh, Petrus. And so I then gave a talk in Marsen, and then gave a talk in Warsaw, and then a talk in Stockholm, and attended, say, OpenCon, FOSDEM, Linux TAG, System DE, and various European events, something I could never, ever, ever do from the United States. I then hosted PyCon. It was for the Pike programming language. I hosted uh, Peter Hanstein to give a PF talk at the University of Latvia. The MySQL developers were coming through town, so I hosted a meetup with them. And then eventually a talk in Vienna, more or less in Vienna. So a, a, a deep, deep thank you. I then returned to the US and I've been organizing the Portland Linux Unix group for about a, a 150 plus speakers for over a decade. And then additional things such as uh, BSD CAN and Asia BSD CON and OSCON and you name it, a number of things. So thanks to Ryanair 99 Euro cent plus tax flights and essentially Euro BSD CON and the influence and the wonderful, wonderful people, I have been set down a rather unique path and I hope some of you have benefited from that craziness. Paul, may you rest in peace. I miss you dearly. So on, on that very point, as I wrap it up, uh, do embrace the formality. Uh, Christoph, you are right. Uh, yes, uh, writing a paper is good for the brain. It's good for your career. Being forced to communicate an idea, a project, a something is indeed important. It's good for your, again, brain, your career, you name it. And uh, I guarantee I was more shy than you. I, I, I promise I was. Believe it or not, <laughs> it's just a skill to do this. And then once you get passionate, it gets kind of wild. So moving on, uh, can everyone hear me fine? Uh, maybe put in the chat there. I Yes, great. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I'm talking to myself because, hey, I do a lot of that. OK, a little, uh, just briefly, briefly about inspiration and motivations. And uh, I've always wanted a sabbatical. And the pandemic gave this nice, crappy sabbatical, not quite what I pictured. So. A little context, January of 99, uh, 91, let's see, a few months before the announcement of Linux, I sat down at a Unix system in college, literally across the forest here. And coming from Hollywood, it was like, oh, whoa, that's the inside of the computer. I actually totally understand behind the camera. That makes great sense. 
I discovered Red Hat Linux. It's a Portland Linux town. There's Torvalds like drives by. I uh, discovered 5.2 and thought, wow, this is a great scrappy little Unix clone. But uh, if you haven't heard of RPM Hell, go ahead and look that up. Uh, I, I don't want to scar you further, but it did so many things right. But wow, something's wrong. And then by that time, this whole notion of open source was becoming clear to people. At first, in a Unix environment, you have like sources and stuff and compilers and very little notion of what's open and free software and what you can do. But move on. Eventually, I realized looking at the Windows NT stack, it's like, wow, you can have a web server for a thousand bucks and a mail server for a thousand bucks. You can't fix them. You can't have features responded to. You, especially on the desktop, features are not welcome. Apple at one point said, no, please do not send feature requests. We might uh, face a risk of lawsuit if you sue us for implementing your idea. So don't, don't, don't send any ideas. Like, whoa, that's a really crappy model. So, and then of course the cloud came along and things started going cloudified. So this is about a lab. I don't have a lot of pictures in this, but uh, a lab can be simple. It can be a virtual machine on a proprietary OS. So fundamentally, open source is participatory. It's going to conferences, it's sharing code with people, it's interacting. And yeah, ironically, we're often shy by nature, but we manage. So a proprietary platform can work. You can have a, a VM on a totally proprietary OS and do all your work there or have a complete stack like, uh, I don't know, VS Code and work on open source software. Great, that works, but whatever. But as, as I'll touch on many times, there is a fundamental need for isolation. And in practicality, like look, look at the scenario I put there. It's like, honey, what do you think of Haiku OS? And your spouse responds, I have a conference call in 10 minutes. What the hell is this? So it's good to separate those things, just like a different machine, different room, different room for the noisy stuff, you know. So going crazy full circle, I dug up my slides from 2008. And I'm like, OK, let's 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 see what what's there. And here that just a few of them, I swear it's quick. So looking at my motivations, it was nonetheless still RPM hell. And that absolutely emphasized. Uh, Thank you, Jan. I'll get to that. Emphasize the need for separation, isolation. And Christoph did some fantastic work on like a taxonomy of isolation and compartmentalization all before Docker, all before all these nifty things. And I threw and get off my file system. I think I was looking forward to very good file systems. So uh, yes, Jan, I, I don't know. I used quite a few hypervisors. There will be a few in this talk, so, so stay tuned. Uh, Cross-platform development, yes, you can have that VM. You can have multiple VMs on a proprietary OS and do nifty things and test your one little bit of code, just like, I don't know, Jorgen does with uh, OpenZFS on Windows and Mac. So off you go. One keyboard. I'm not good with the whole army of keyboards and KVMs and all that. I just want to focus. So there are a lot of ways to do that, be it RDP, you name it. But it's there's so many flexible options right now. It's awesome. And key point, the consolidation of systems. So looking back, wow, across the way there, I... I'm told in retrospect, I sat down at a 33 megahertz Sun 4490 running BSD, I think, 4.3. And it was great. You go, you type W, who. There are hundreds of users doing chat, doing news groups, doing FTP, doing all their things. It was like, wow, this is amazing. This is like less power than a Raspberry Pi, but um, but it's all happening simultaneously. And then you get this whole push to the desktop and boom, boom, boom client server and whatever. And it's like, wait, one person's doing one thing and st servers are struggling. So back then looking to the future, it's like, what if it was, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of like instances or users or people having their own little workspace. And it's like, okay, fine. Maybe that's sort of slowly materialized. And then ultimately I was like, wait, I remember this. My ultimate motivation in all of this, and I take this to my grave, is that I just want my computer to work reliably. It's as simple as that. And open source is the strategy to really say, okay, I want great file systems. I want applications. I want them contained uh, and all that. So there you have it. That hasn't changed for decades. So going more focused, I have to look back. Well, I consider the authorized, because now that security is a major factor in all things, including storage, which was so nice when that was like someone else's problem. The authorized and validated synchronous write within hardware and virtual machines is pretty much the highest priority. I'm I'm a part of a SNEA committee, the uh, Storage Networking Industry Association, and I was like, if we were to distill all this stuff, fiber channel, all, all this stuff to one thing, 
it is data hitting a persistent storage device synchronously and reliably. So fast forward, and I didn't realize this way back 20, what are years ago? That means hardware machines, virtual machines, open ZFS and NVMe, which is a nifty technology, because I'll briefly beat up on SATA and SAS flash devices. That is just an abomination. Why take like a whole new metaphor and dumb it down to le legacy compatibility, unless you truly need that. But if you're looking forward, well, I'm glad that SATA and SAS uh, is, flash is going away slowly. Anyway, a brief blah, blah, blah about blah, blah, blah. So. I have, I believe, Alan Jude to thank for pointing out the 2080 rule of open source. Now, this is not to be confused with the 80-20 principle in which 20% of your inputs give rise to 80% of your outputs and fire 80% of your clients and focus on the 20 blah, blah, blah. This is not that. So uh, I'll describe it on the next one, but in really short terms, it's like, oh, my God, your hypervisor booted. And that's literally me when I got Beehive working my daughter was, oh so, gosh, small. She's now 16. <clears throat> that was some time ago. So users cheer and bemoan your exciting new project when it's like 20% complete. It's like, whoa, the, the, the future is here. Oh my gosh, just work on that, work on that. And then they bemoan when you're at like 80% complete because it's like, well, wait, you're missing this thing. And the, you know, the proprietary one has whatever, VMware has the thing. And why doesn't your hypervisor, the hypervisor, any hypervisor that's open source have it, blah, blah, blah. So I get it. I totally get it. And <clears throat> that said, if 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 you are so fearful of like this this twenty percent or the fifty percent, I'm thinking like, okay, if you're worried about a midlife crisis, you will hate a full life crisis. And I can think of oh oh right here, there are some great examples of one hundred percent software. That's not twenty percent, not eighty percent, one hundred percent. FileMaker Pro 4 and 4.1, I have never been more powerful with uh, just pushing data around. Yes, totally proprietary, but oh my gosh, I could generate like RTF files with that long ago. In conjunction with freehand, wow, I could make RTF, import it into a from a database to a presentation document to, for printing and have a, an amazing workflow. And you can't have it for any fee right now. And oh, look at this big bad boy. I've got my Unixware box. I've, I've, I never quite got it to work right. I even have the SDK here. So uh, that's what 100% software looks like. It is dead. And look at what happened to OpenOffice.org. It was shifted over to Apache. Like, great, good license. Great, but like too late. So it is like shelved there so that uh, I guess a few contracts can be fulfilled and everyone moved to LibreOffice. Like, well, the right thing happened too late. It's at like 90 something percent and the Pike programming language. I couldn't find many references, but I think they're still alive. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, Python 2, that is absolutely the most timely example where it's like it's mature. It's feature complete. It's great. It's the bane of ports right now. because it's like, oh, no, nope, sorry. End of life. Get rid of that. And you can't have Chromium. I missed the last talk. I was like getting ready for this. But. That all said, oh, yeah, dumping CCBs. Oh, yeah. So I've given talks on vaporware, complete vaporware. At Meet BSD 2010, everyone talked about, like, we need a hypervisor. And, like, okay, so nothing came out of that until it did. And I gave a talk in Tokyo about disk control. And it was absolute out of my behind vaporware. And in that conversation was like, what if we had a, like a utility to dump CCBs, the cam control blocks? And so these are just ideas and nothing more. But hey, there will be a talk tomorrow, the same time about smart eight, man page eight, which was the evolution of uh, <clears throat> disk control. Thank you, Chuck, for making that real. The hypervisor thing, I think they, they've made some progress from just an idea. And so looking back, I'd say the first 1% of software development on a project is just as important as the last 100% and every step in between. Because, hey, if we were like one and zero, we like wouldn't have conferences. It wouldn't have like decades of PF talks and you name it. I'm going to quickly look over the chat for a sec. Da, 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 da. Yes. So correct, Alan. So if, for those sort of paying attention, uh, Warner Lash has produced a, a camcorder for recording 
uh, CCBs out of a storage stack, a bit like USB dump or any TCB dump, any kind of dump. So you just sort of cap into the, the flood and hey, it was just an idea in a conference. Maybe they independently got to that same idea, but hey, I recall it coming up in a talk. So similarly, I've got a very, very gentle Lewis Carroll theme going on here, which is like, hey, why sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. So hey, you know, be creative. Don't feel bad. Don't hold back. Just, just say it, do it. Trust your instincts. So that's a little introductory stuff. In the context of being accused of giving talks on vaporware and at times being a no-op and being, gee, but just a, a noisy wheel, brace yourselves for actionable hardware lessons followed by actionable software lessons. I'm pretty sure every one of you will learn something in the next 20 minutes. Uh, I've failed if you don't. So back to the lab. So there was, I believe, a home lab discussion. I trust it went really well, unless it's tomorrow and I might be able to catch it. There is a log and various info at called for testing.org. Yes, the site's neglected. I love Twitter. It allows, allows for interactions in, instantly around the world, unlike uploading blog pages, but eh, whatever. I'll, I'll, I, I, the log is more updated. And hopefully this is totally deduplicated with all that. So hopefully you learned something. Number one, dream big. Imagine your dream lab on paper. From day one, even if you don't have a budget, uh, maybe you'll have a job that includes that lab and you'll need to know to recognize it when you see it. So learn hardware platforms, vendors, you name it. The more you learn, the more you will know, which is very, very helpful. And then if you say, wow, this old switch was fantastic, or this machine, this old ThinkPad, whatever, once you learn to recognize that, you learn to recognize deals at your local uh, Craigslist type site, SSLV, whatever, or eBay especially. And so keep in mind, hardware pricing defies logic. I'll touch on that a little later. From there, placeholders are just fine. If you want a server rack, a bunch of free servers from colleagues stacked up and thrown together will teach you something. It may teach you that you never want that damn model again ever because it needs firmware that's unobtainable and it's expensive and it's loud and your power bill went nuts, but you'll learn something. So please learn. Number three, recycling centers are your friends. I don't know if there's such a thing in Europe, but over here in this state of Oregon, there is a budget. Every time you buy a major appliance or a computer technology, a tiny bit of money goes into a fund and that fund goes into recycling centers so that you can confidently bring something in and they appear to have fair, free game to sell those such that they often recycle probably 80% of it, use 10% perhaps with uh, programs that you'll see at FreeGeek. FreeGeek.org, check them out. They are like a shining example of what can be done. And then they sell some either in a local thrift store or online. That is invaluable because often it's very recent, very good stuff, and then they get rid of the junk. So it's kind of win-win. You want to befriend those. You want to meet them. You want to have a relationship where they have a little watch list for you, which is awesome because it's like, oh, you're looking for JBots. Yes, I'm looking for JBots. So, and then, hey, once you're done with all that stuff, you can give it back to them and they'll take it because that's what they do. So, uh, Daniel, you in there? I hope you're in there. Uh, okay. So a funny thing about UPS, we, Think of them as computer parts. The rest of the world just considers them necessary evils. So your, your phone system has a UPS backing it up for reasons, whatever. So electricians are often tasked with bringing them in, cycling them out every three years. So they don't worry about batteries and model numbers and all that. They just wholesale in, wholesale out. Find some local le electricians to befriend because I'd hope you never pay for high-end UPSs. You only pay for battery replacement when necessary. And so if you make friends with an electrical consulting con contracting firm, they'll be like, sure, make them go away. They're off to the recycling center. And you may have to take all of whatever's in their stack, but you take the good ones. You take some of the recycling or to your friends or whatever. You rebattery a few. A high-end UPS is great for power conditioning alone. And even if you get five minutes of power backup when it was originally certified for 30 minutes, that's still useful. And if it's free of charge, great. So make friends with it. 
you'll thank yourself. And Daniel, you're in, uh, I believe, Denmark looking for UPSs. And uh, as we chatted about yesterday, this is what I'm referring to. So uh, there are those same points about, hey, uh, even if you get a pile of different ones, and you're like, oh, I'm a, I like this vendor. Well, you will learn something from each one. If you provide, say, consulting and support, you can learn how the UPS nut utility interacts with each one. So you will learn something that's a theme of all of this. So when it comes to a lab, yeah, stay consistent as your budget progresses. Uh, buy, try to buy two of each, especially for like server-ish stuff or you name it, because uh, sometimes you need diversity. Sometimes you need one model of everything. If you're a, I don't know, storage developer or something or packaging software, you name it. But often you want two identicals. I, I instinctively started doing this years ago as, as I could afford it. And often that meant for me putting one co-located, big old tower system co-located at an ISP and then having one locally to like test and update, you name it, because uh, you don't want to do that in production. So as I touched on earlier, lot pricing can defy logic. If you want to get an Ampanol fancy name brand SATA cable, it's often 16 euro for one. If you want 25 of them, it's like 16 euro for the same. So it's a bit like a convenience store. You've probably heard that term, convenience store pricing. Moving on about that consistency, I've been, I, this is partly from memory, partly from, from some random stuff I found. Uh, I had two Pentium 2s in big old towers. And in Europe, in Riga, I had little one gigahertz mini ITX VIA machines back when VIA padlock were a thing. That was cool. I see I, I have a, an estimate, which I think I bought for two tower machines, Pentium 4s. There they were. And then following that in the 2010s, I had some rando free service when I returned to the U.S. and had no budget whatsoever. Then random pre Sandy Bridge think pads, then some Sandy Bridge onward when things really got interesting because of, say, virtualization support. And moving forward, uh, I am more or less happy with the HBZ workstations. They are targeted to engineers and people don't know what to make of them. So it's like, hey, here's a i5 desktop for $150. I'll give an example in dollars. And then the E3 is like $80 because people don't really know in that those circles. Like <laughs> one's a fancier model than the other. Okay, fine. I won't argue with you. And I'll, I've been, I think I have about 11 that, of the Z220s that I've slowly acquired when I saw a good deal because, hey, I learned that, hey, I can have a stack of like ZFS simple reference machines by doing that. Uh, the, the higher end Zs are okay, but I found that they brick when you remove and transplant RAM. I don't know what's up, up with that, and that's a bummer. So I was lucky to find two compellent rebranded R720s at the local, local recycling center. Those have proven useful, but they're getting a bit old. The, one of the first pieces of hardware that I actually put new money into for new hardware uh, was an HP Epic for builds. Oh my gosh, it's fast. It's really fast. And that's changed my whole workflow. And as we get to a little software bits later in this, uh, you'll see some results of that. And then uh, looking forward during a pandemic, wow, recertified Dell R730XDs are really handy because uh, with a global chip shortage and supplies shortage, uh, you can have them in like a week instead of like you know, four months. <laughs> so moving on, lesson six, noise and power draw. Huge progress has been made since almost everything from like 2010 ish, maybe 2012, definitely onward. Like a Dell R710 is remarkably quiet, whereas all predecessors should pretty much be recycled and put into retro computing. That's just opinion. Um, there's a whole green movement. Uh, switch vendors are realizing you might not want a screaming switch and there's a whole fanless movement. So, you know, I do know quite a few people who have had servers under their beds, literally. It's like, watch for dust, but Bless your heart. You couldn't do that before. And you certainly couldn't afford that before. But on that point, one last one there. Uh, there are not a lot of secondhand fanless devices, strangely. Moving on, lesson seven. Oh, you will thank yourself. Consistent cables are generally a very affordable investment, and you will so, so ridiculously thank yourself. I was given a pile of about 20 yay long ethernet cables and i use them to this day however i later realized hey you can get a consistent batch of these little cat six thin ones for not a lot of money when it comes to that sort of cable chaotic mess oh, please do it even with power especially you got those 10 machines from 10 different sources lined up each with a random power cord uh you go with a perhaps a workbench power strip and a short one foot 
cord to each one you will sew. So thank yourselves. And I've got power devices from my original desktop in 1989. That was my own college, uh, high school machine. It, I've got the little power switch thing from that. It's, it, those last. You'll thank yourself. Uh, is there a way to just make a big old raise hand or some noisy thing if there's a question? Cause hey, I'm totally happy to answer questions, but it'll probably get more question oriented a little later. Moving on. Oh my gosh. If you can't afford the cables yet, get the screws. You will so, so, so thank yourself, especially in storage to get just 50 to 100 little identical screws. Some caddies have little longer ones, some shorter, but the cool black ones cost the same as the others. And silver and black are both as easy to lose on a floor. They, they, they do hurt to step on, but uh, yeah, get some screws. You will thank yourself. Touching on power, as you kind of grow your lab, there's that bench power strip that uh, they are not computer components. They're very affordable. And go with that. Go with some short power cords. You can have a really clean lab for very little money. Uh, Cyber Power, oh my gosh, I hit the name, does some rather affordable PDUs. Like there's one that has a little number with uh, the current draw. And in the middle is a little checker. There are various forms in the US or ones with like three lights and some fancy ones like this. You really want to check each port before you deploy it because, uh, yeah, I've had some that uh, actually don't ask. <laughs> it's just please check your ports. Moving on, there are lots of full height cabinets out there. Just just say no, send them to the recycling center. Half heights, maybe. But I found that these little like folding nifty little micro racks designed for like the tiny telco thing on the wall are really useful for like a switch or two, a KVM and a few little goodies and a PDU. and there's one in the garage. There's one upstairs in the lab. And yay. Uh, a two shelf rolling cart, super useful. I've used the same metro tall shelf, stainless, cost 100 bucks back then. They're now like 500. Timeless, priceless. Go with it. It's not a computer co component, but it's fantastic at that. And of course, hey, the IKEA lac rack makes a great story. You probably go search it, maybe put, put in the chat there. The lac rack, which is made on this sort of Lack brand furniture oh. <laughs> for a server, but it doesn't have a lot of meat to tie into for screws and all that. But it makes a great story. Anyway, moving on. I don't know what changed there. Uh, yeah, so storage devices. In the good old days, I would have said, yes, invest in some. Oh, did I lose video? And oh, I lost video when I did this. So I'll poke some, push some buttons here. Sorry. You need the hand gestures, of course. I think your last hand oh, just showed you a table out or something. What's that? Yeah, I, I turned to the lac rack. I'm so excited here. There we go. Um, I was lucky to get some cheapo BX500 drives. They were like 20 bucks a pop, and now they're like, they were 40, and then they were unobtainable. Ooh, I lost my microphone too. So now with the pandemic and supply shortages and, and mining operations, good luck out there. It's it's brutal, but uh, all hard drives are terrible in some way. So you'll learn something from all of them. And as I touched on earlier, U.2 storage is the future, in my opinion. Wow, it does it does away with SATA and SAS interfaces, and is like a native PCI interface. Yay! And the support in the operating systems one might discuss at this conference has become has become very good. I previously beat it, beat up on why SAS and SATA shouldn't have happened. It's abom an abomination. So. As for IKEA, those tubs are amazingly useful. I should have brought a sample, but they, they go from like this big for all the little parts and maybe CPUs and RAM and screws and stuff and the little CPU paste to big ones to you name it. Those are ridiculously useful. And don't forget the lids that either sell it with the lid or without. I don't know. It's don't screw up and leave without the lid because you may not get it next round, especially during a pandemic. But anyway, moving on to lesson 13. Network infrastructure, uh, yes, network. Um, that's a whole different sea of ideas and categories and products and I, not my specialty. However, I found that going with first, whatever switches your colleagues will give you is like the best switches in the world because they're yours and they work and you can experiment and learn something from them. Maybe learn that you hate them, maybe learn that you love them. But uh I found that some just big old ports all across the front, 48 port dumb switches are ex always useful. Even if you're getting the fancy switches, have the dumb ones just because it's consistent. There's no like patch Tuesday for them. 
uh, great in the lab, you'll thank yourself. And I watch for prices to drop on those for under 100 bucks. You can generally get a decent 48 port switch. That's my opinion. So document as you go. You will so thank yourself. Uh, serial numbers, license keys, when you bought stuff, IP addresses for the lab. I, and I've learned to be consistent. <laughs> it's really helpful. Like one password for certain lab stuff and sequences and the IPMI IP below the the machine that it controls, firmware revisions, all that. And even things like with those little clunky Z220s, note the RAM and such. And when you're shopping for more and you see a great price and it's the exact model you want, move quick. So the more you document, the more you'll thank yourself. Moving on. Ultimately, know where your data is. This talk has forced me to bring together previous presentations, and I'm sure like all of you, uh, I had like presentation.pdf, which is great that week and terrible eight years later. So name things well. That's in fact, you know, in the context of ransomware and data protection, it's really good to know where stuff is. But let's just say you'll thank yourself for every single bit of organization you do there. It's good to know where those ISOs are. Sometimes you need an old ISO of really old stuff. Just, hey, try to stay organized. And looking back to like the 2008 or thereabouts, none of us had space for many ISOs. Disks were tiny and slow and expensive. And so now, hey, knock yourself out. It's easy. So as you grow your lab, this is the foundation of growth. It's like, oh, here's the model I want. I need some of these. And back full circle to the first slide, have on paper a design of your dream lab. and Build it up as you go. It's worked for me. Hey, and it works in a small apartment. I did it in a small apartment within the confines of that and a budget. And now I've got stuff in the garage, you name it. So I've found that collaborative docs are super useful for that, especially if you say give someone VPN access to that lab and say, hey, okay, here's where to go find that thing. Please install to this machine, you name it. There really needs to be an open alternative to Google Docs, be it Col Collabora, you name it. But it's not quite here in my experience. Maybe it's here, maybe it's not. I Gosh, this this presentation's in Google Docs. I feel somewhat bad about that, but my gosh, it's a useful tool. Then on to the uh, consistency you get out of consistent devices. Well, test that they're consistent. If you get two little machines that are in that whole palette of them, whatever, make sure they all perform similarly. Hey, a drive might be failing on one or for whatever reason, one has some very inappropriate RAM that makes the performance much worse. So it's actually good to just bench stuff, have a nice baseline to compare everything to. And there was this, this guy here in town who built cables in the 90s, back when cables were like a totally fancy thing. And he's like, okay, check every pin. The person who made this cable has never used a computer. I'm like, oh gosh, okay. So I have definitely had issues with uh, those power sockets, uh, less so with network devices, believe it or not, but yes, and eventually they will give you trouble. Uh, I think in the last home lab session uh, at BSD Can, I talked about power draw. That's a whole different thing all itself. I have a lab doc linked from call for testing that does go through everything there with a whole bunch of model numbers and you name it. I should post that at some point. Please post it if you find it there. Uh, check for noise. Noise can be a warning of bad things. It can be a warning of, oh, you brought the wrong, brought the wrong model, you name it. So just test, test, test. You will learn. It, whenever there are identical systems, yeah, verify that because uh, you never know. Anyway, ideally, you log things cradle to grave from the moment it arrives and you document the warranty from day one and you have a plan for it years later at that recycling center. So, yeah, lesson 16. Ah, anything can fail. It's funny. Uh, anything, literally anything can fail. Power, the, the simple double is the dumbest power cord can fail. Uh, never rule out anything new and expensive does not always mean it's not going to be DOA, dead on arrival. Uh, be nimble when, say, giving a talk and having two more computers here handy, my nifty new, and this could, should have been a slide. The, the, eBay, not so cheap, but not so expensive. ThinkPad T480 is quite promising. I have a, my wife's air there. I've got machines ready to quickly, nimbly jump between them. Do the same in a lab because, yeah, stuff can fail. Ergonomics matter. Uh, 
Yeah, personal protective equipment, as we've especially learned during the silly pandemic, is not that expensive. And you can have like designer masks, like where are the Euro BSD con masks? I guess it's not in person, but it might be nice. BSD can masks, maybe, maybe. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give this example in a slide or two, but it, just protect your ears. The treatments are expensive and crazy and like disposable gloves are handy. And I've, I've hated every keyboard of my entire career. So I cannot say what to, what to get. No idea. Not a clue. Uh, sitting technologies at the very moment I am in this Bombach saddle chair I picked up in the nineties. Let me not unplug myself, but you probably haven't seen one of these and you probably won't see another one. So it's like literally a saddle, but with a back optional back, you might see them at say a European oh, checkout line or in a medical facility where it's like, whoa, you mean you don't force your workers to stand all day? That's, that's weird. But uh, such is life. Invest in all that. You will thank yourself. And a chair might last a decade, whereas a you know, certain Raspberry Pi goes uh, weeks until you burn it up. So hearing especially, uh, I live in these, especially with like kids running around and uh, flying to, say, Asia. Yeah, they might think it's the fancy beats, whatever noise canceling. No, it's just like <laughs> it's probably what the ground crew has outside the plane. But uh, combined with now these uh, wired bone conduction headphones and Thaddeus on Twitter, Blue Collar Mage, suggested them. And oh, my gosh, he needed them in a machine shop so he can hear people and like for safety, but like hear music. So they're a bit tinny, but oh, my gosh, they're great. And being somewhat flush and these kind of squishy, you can actually combine them, which is cool. So I I live in those and doing support calls. I have two of those that I've been picking up secondhand because the wired ones are now discontinued. Uh, for what it's worth, I like the think chairs. I saw a mention of a chair, but I, I literally have a second one. They are USB battery powered. That's a there's no power little indicator of like how much is left, but hey, oh, they've changed my workflow. And I was so nervous about in-ear earbuds nuking my ears for conference call after conference call. So moving on, learn, 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 learn. Everything will teach you something, even that big old thing you tear apart because it's dead and you just see how things are laid out and what screws they use. Go for it. Colleagues are fantastic. The hallway track is invaluable. Folks like Alan who just chat is like, oh, well, I use this KVM and this whatever. Just, just Ah, milk your colleagues for information. They're brilliant and they're sharing and share what you've learned. It's great. It's a two way street. Uh, I keep saying it. Hey, knowing what not to buy is just as important as knowing what to buy. That's very key. When someone's like, Hey, you can pick up this whole palette of cool switches that are all power draining. They're screaming loud. You name it. So again, there's some great stuff on Reddit. There's a home lab session here. Pay it forward. Hey, you outgrow a laptop. Give it to another developer. Just there's, I guarantee there's someone local or at a conference or otherwise. Yes, I've seen quite a few handoffs at conferences. Like, oh, right, here's the new thing. Go for it. Enjoy. And you can see more notes on the lab document there. And uh, I think that links to the home lab Google Doc. And then there's the log, which has some goodies. And finally, my absolute secret weapon is what's called over here painter's tape. It's easy to apply, easy to remove. Uh, and a what's over here a sharpie pen and often i just have like okay what the disc is how good the battery is and what os is on there because often you know those think pads they look alike so usb keys especially like oh my gosh they, they all have this like scribbly like free nas whatever version you name it installer or boot device all those flash media used to have a tiny little field where you could write something once like no 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 you you have to iterate quickly this is priceless any questions? Whew. Okay, buckle up. Software lessons. Absolutely preaching to the converted. Own the stack. The BSDs and Illumos are the way to have a complete operating system stack where you can poke at any layer of it, talk to colleagues at any layer, and fix stuff, improve stuff, and make a career of stuff, and make a conference talk of this one little thing, tiny, tiny little thing down there. So they are, they're awesome, and that is critical. That is just absolutely critical to standing by it, delivering it, delivering a service, a, a 
reliable internal service, whatever. You, uh, you all know that, but just, just, hey, let's all be thankful for that. There's a consistency of these systems, the documentation. It's Unix behind the camera. That's how the system works. That's just how computers work. And there have been uh, countless Unix replacements written in Unix, and they will continue to replace Unix for decades to come with Unix. Uh, Control T, super useful. Open ZFS. Oh my gosh, Dtrace. Beehive, jail, zones. I can suppose, I suppose throw Zen on there. We'll get to that later. Uh, the BSDs, bless your hearts, upstream of OpenSSH, PF, Mandoc, OpenRSync. Countless heavy lifting technologies that are like well documented, reliable, with cool people. Awesome. I love you all. Um, that is a unrivaled, highly flexible, repairable toolkit. I like this toolkit, and I guess you wouldn't be here. You totally disagreed. I'll do a quick one on everyone knows that, because these are little things that, oh my gosh, blew my mind. And here they are, because you should, you probably know this, but there's no shame in not knowing this because everyone learned something at some point. So control T, the progress of a command line utility. It was at the uh, Solaris day, uh, ZFS day hosted by, I think, Joint back in 2012-ish before it became the Open ZFS Developer Summit. Uh, someone was flashing a USB drive into control T. I was like, what the hell was that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Cool. Wait, I didn't know that. It was on Mac. What? What? What the hell? Anyway, um, so you install a FreeBSD package. Uh, type rehash if nothing's like working. It's like, oh, okay. Um, I that that's really helpful if you uh, didn't know that. Uh, if you've got some later ThinkPads like this old T four eighty, function control K gives you the scroll back because on the hardware console that's still really useful. On FreeBSD you can panic the system at will, which might be used for useful for testing, debugging, you name it. And it's like, why don't they tell you that? And uh, if you hop into uh, single user mode, it's not always intuitive. They just type exit. That's it. And thank you, Alan and Clara, or someone at Clara. Uh, I did not know you simply do shut down now, and it kicks you into single user mode. Exit again. Kick right back. What the? Wait. What? <laughs> it's sad, but hey, you learn. Uh, with it enabled, you can do control out escape on FreeBSD, and it kicks you in the d debugger, which, as I'm racing through early Beehive, is like, I panicked it. It's like, oh, I didn't. And uh, What the hell? So that's kind of cool. Oh, from, I think, uh, a little chat earlier, maybe late last night, uh, Etsy update extract before you, uh, as you're doing an upgrade, because, hey, you actually want to do a three-way merge, and you don't want to lose the opportunity as you go a little further down the road there. Uh, someone suggested, I think Jan, of like, hey, uh, you can't read a man page you don't know about. So it's actually very helpful to go rummage through them, look for a name, because they might not be found in apropos. And then you can pump them into mandoc directly or zgrep or all sorts of things. So that's your friend. That was a great tip. Moving on, a few ZFS ones that I've seen. Uh, it's funny. You can type like ZFS get written and it shows you the written property for all your data sets and like uh wait i saw a client do that in belgium ironically in a hotel I'm like what the hell did you just do I, I i didn't know you could do that you don't have to like specify each one and there you go very useful uh zpool import dash n without mounting anything fantastic when you're replicating to it i love it i love it do it all the time uh as jan pointed out hey zfs diff it's it's powerful. It looks at two snapshots, compares the content, tell you what's modified, deleted, you name it. Very cool. I will touch on that a little later. Uh, Z Zpool import dash n, a dry run. I almost say that should be the fault. My gosh, especially when doing something fragile, it's like, this should work. This shouldn't work. Look out. You name it. Oh, ZFS set read only equals on. You can have immutability free of charge anytime, any place. Instead of like unmount file system, remount, all that stuff we used to do, it's free. It's awesome. I'll touch on that later. And of course, show the snapshot directory is visible. Don't aim rsync at it. You will be unhappy. But what it gives you is like a virtual representation of every point in time. It's awesome. OK, moving on. So you got that ThinkPad or similar, you name it. Well, ACPI comp dash. I012, however many batteries you have, it will tell you the design capacity of that battery and the last full capacity. When you receive a new laptop such as this one off of eBay, it's good to know if that's like 
80% good or 5% good. A bit like new PS batteries. Your mileage may vary. Very, very, very helpful. Whew. I get to see broken stuff all the time. And these MCA errors are terrifying. That's if on free here, free BSD. If you have, say, a failing memory module, it's not always as simple as the out of band management saying, hey, this module is broken. Go replace it with a clear guidance of guide of where it is. Cause hey, it's like eight modules are they all alike and then CPU one or zero or one. Blah. So on some platforms, that warning is giving you an address. However, with DMI decode, uh, you can go look at your modules and it gives you a start and stop address. This is definitely on super micro. Not sure about Dell it might not be, but key point that Failed address is an offset. Go find the module. It's within. You'll thank yourself. <sighs> Moving on. So ah, there are a lot of buried leads out there in this community because we all kind of focus on our thing and our thing. So over the years, Samba 4 has sprouted the ability to be a somewhat useful Active Directory server. And it's funny using, like, say, FreeBSD 13 and OpenZFS and Samba 4, you can have one that could be a secondary or do a number of things. I have taken a little old pre proof of concept. I have slammed it into GitHub. This is not an endorsement of GitHub, but there it is. I welcome your pounding on it. I simply configure it on, please, a new separate lab system and give a whole bunch of commands you can use to add a user and poke at it and check it and make it break so uh, i i would love to hopefully find someone here oh who comes to mind uh, patrick hello patrick maybe let's take a look at that uh about bur bur more buried leads uh freebsd has become a pretty good zen host Then i touched on that earlier so it's pretty solid it does things beehive can't do it is lacking uh zen domains but i have a review up and i threw it into this repo so here is a script called Xenomorph to convert a working Zen, uh, a FreeBSD 13 install into a Zen host, and then an example Zen domains, which is the RC script that controls starting, stopping, you name it. Uh, Roger is a busy person. He's doing his best. I believe in current on, main on FreeBSD, it supports UEFI boot. Traditionally, for years, it's been only on legacy boot. It's a whole like, OS within an OS, and it didn't even make the release note. So, hey, take a look. Here's an actionable item that you can go spend an afternoon with. Moving on. <sighs> Smart control, cuddle, whichever term you prefer, finally sprouted JSON output. And there will be a talk tomorrow about Smart Utility, which does a whole bunch of things different and is permissibly licensed. It could be used in a base system or in ZFS. However, uh, here is how you parse basic smart control output with JSON. It's only relatively recent versions that support it, but there it is. If I want to find out the model number, the serial number, I've kind of, as you can see, <laughs> fudged any uh, data here in humorous ways and form factor and speed, you name it, block size, reported block size, go for it. YAML? Don't know. Take a look. Uh, come to our talk tomorrow. So that's useful, actionable. Ah, D trace for the rest of us. It is awesome when Brendan Gregg produces a flame graph that like saved the day or yells at a disk or array or you name it. However, ah, yeah, I just need some really simple stuff. Uh, Git and D trace have a funny habit of like formatting, not quite machine parsable, not quite human readable, like a flame graph. It's just something in between. So I'm like, okay, I will figure this out. So I sat down. I used dash Q to shut up a lot of the like headers and goodies, and then very carefully chose the uh, very much C print style or even shell print F style of what I want to see. So here is some dtrace code to to show the user ID zero uh, epoch timestamp, but in like nanoseconds, so you can either chop it off or do whatever, because hey, of course, if you're chasing on performance, you need fine grain time. <laughs> and of course, what was run. So I just ran it and sat back. And then whenever Cron said, yo, you want to run at run? Okay, it ran at run. If you have some piped commands, it will show up as two commands right after one another, which is fine. So you learn to interpret that. But uh, I can parse the heck out of that. That's useful to me. Flame graphs have their place, and they're awesome in conference presentations. But for me, like, this is useful. So hey, 
Go ahead, copy, paste. So, yeah, uh, this sucker has a Windows key, and um, I, someone paid good money for it, and I technically, technically paid good money for it. So it's good to, like, find out what that is, and they, funny, they don't have a big old sticker anymore, which is now, like, they got smaller and smaller, and then they slammed it in a BIOS. Here is how to obtain the Windows key from a probably Ivy Bridge and later laptop, possibly desktop, from you, whatever UFI place or ACPI where it's hidden away. Uh, here's a syntax to grab that. Uh, it takes the ACPI CA tools, and that is not a typo, and I checked it three times. No, that's the name. And no, that's not really a, a key, but it, it's got hints of a real key. So you might find that useful. And slow, slam it into your documentation system. Please, you'll thank yourself. Especially, I'll go back a sec, especially when your kids are like thrown into homeschooling and suddenly all your lab, previous older lab ThinkPads become homeschooling machines, which they did. So now down the rabbit hole, in the context of open owning the stack, here is something that FreeBSD can do extremely well. Uh, this has been a journey since like 2003. I'll get to that. I was hoping for maybe some rabbit hole imagery, but I didn't want to violate any copyright, so I thought this medieval image is somewhat appropriate for the battle I've been fighting. So let's take a moment to reflect. Uh, FreeBSD 13 is a total milestone in obvious and not so obvious ways. Oh, whoops, I should have thrown Zenhost on there. It's like, it does it. It's re it seems reliable. Um, that that was not working for a very long time. It draws upon upstream open ZFS. It includes reproducible builds. It is pulled from Git. It has working source.com build options. And I repeat, it has working build options. And some of you have heard me just talk over and over about this. And some of you are like, what the hell is a build option? So let's get into that briefly, briefly, I promise. So going back to 2003, I discovered JL and it's like, oh, sweet, great. Um, so you're saying I could have like a binary for send mail, a few dependencies, throw it in a jail, and bang, I have a mail server that does one thing well. Cool. Great. I like it. Thank you. I'll take it. And you could, there are tricks to like subtract stuff until it breaks or use LDD to find dependencies and build it till it works. And there are a lot of ways to do this. However, for decades, FreeBSD has had build options in which you say include something. Don't include something. Sometimes that means including an experimental feature. Sometimes that means removing stuff. And removing stuff was broken for a very, very long time. I'll touch on how to detect those things, what to do about it, you name it. But for now, hey, from a like high perspective, like you want a faster build? Build less. You want to contain software. Wow, maybe we call them containers. I don't know. If you look at man, the manual page for source.conf, you will see a whole bunch of, say, on 13, 230-ish options without accounting, without ACPI, to start at the top there. And some of them are with, where you can add a feature without send mail. Yes, Jan. Um, and so I thought, oh, how about, like, firewall, block all, add what you need. How about I just turn everything off and add what I want until it works? Um, that's been horribly painful for years until the 13 release. And I want to, I will thank everyone who helped make that happen. Here's a random example. So you go into like source and do show config and it throws out this, this list of where it's at. So MKVI, let's make VI. And in this example, it's an okay example. Uh, when you're building the rescue crunch gen items, include VI. It's like, okay, fine. And then, yeah, alias at EX. Fine. So you can get to control on, off, on, off, flip the switch. So uh, for for a very, very long time, uh, Paul Hennenkemp has had the build option survey sitting in user source tools tools. And I cannot imagine how long it used to take to run, but it steps through every build option. It looks at how much space it saves, if it does in fact work. And some of you may recall me running the build option survey as best I could on just hardware and just waiting and waiting and saying, oh, this is broken. And then talking to various folks and say, hey, should this work? That's the first key question. Is this known to work? Did it once work, et cetera? So I took the, the build option survey and fixed, brought it a little bit into the modern era. So you can only say, choose 
test test the ones you want. Focus on the hard ones rather than everything, because I'm pretty sure without VI is working, it's, I haven't had a problem. <clears throat> and I've thrown in some tools uh, like find faults, which when you get a a build failure and you get a whole bunch of garbage, and if you've got say parallel builds, you've got like failed here, 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 because they're all the parallel things that, that of course died with the one thing that really failed. Here is a grep syntax to look at that output and hop ahead roughly to where it says stopped because that's when it actually failed and then a little synt context. So that's been super useful for uh, for seeing how and when a build failed on you. So yeah, I did my nudging, my grumbling, my reporting, and thank you, Kyle Evans, thank you, Mitchell Horn, thank you, Bjorn Z, who got network without networking to work. Oh my gosh, and Ed Mass, who's been really kind of championing a bunch of this. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there are a few oddballs that either need to be enabled for it to function at all or need to go and source and whatever. Thank you. This is huge progress and the foundation for a whole bunch of coming stuff. So that said, you may have caught my talk at NiceBug about Occam BSD, which is like, well, what if we just streamline the creation of a, a bare minimum virtual machine or jail, leveraging the heck out of a minimum source.conf, actually a maximum source.conf, which is tons of stuff you don't want, a kernel configuration file that uh, gives a bare minimum. And currently it spits out to Beehive, Zen, and Jail. Zen isn't very tested, so that's like literally fresh. Jail is kicking into the root directory in the jail, which doesn't seem like it's correct, but I will look at that as soon as possible. And thank you, Antonig, for taking a peek at it. So I kept finding myself doing that now that they work. So I threw them in a library, and the library can be found in Occam BSD. It can be found in the next tool. You may find that useful. So as we get there, uh, if you build FreeBSD, uh, it's handy to be, do it at arm's length. So you like uh, have a separate object directory in your specified in your script. You have a source.conf, which is very important when doing this. Uh, you specify where to find that source tree. You maybe set some parallel builds. And when, you, when it comes to install time, you set a destination directory. And uh, two kids have just walked in and walked out. So many of you have probably seen desk deer for like jails and such for installation. But here's all the other stuff for the other part. And I'm one, it's really useful. Two, I will leverage the heck out of that later in a few slides. So, yeah, let's talk Git for a sec because, hey, uh, Git's here. It's a thing. Cool. And I keep hearing this like false dichotomy of like developers versus ordinary users. Well, yeah, OK. There are, yes, there are committers. There are countless developers, all 90% of those, 99% are users. And then there are, yes, independent users. We all consume the source tree in some way. So here is some copy paste useful Git goodies that took hours and hours to figure out that aren't super well documented. Hey, it's actionable, it's free to use, go for it. So here's how to truly mirror the repo. So, and please submit fixes uh, in the software that draws on this or in chat, wherever you name it. But let's mirror it and keep that mirror up to date. Let's pull a branch from it. Here's the syntax to do that. And notice that like the source directory will sometimes be generated for you. So keep track of that. But I, I verified that all these are correct. You can copy and paste, change the URLs to your liking, and verify, again, a lot like the make-c independent position independent syntax in this directory, run this command. Yay. OK, I'm on the right branch. Good. Okay, thank you. So here's how to check out a specific uh, uh, hash commit. Cool. Well, funny. I want a source tree and a specific one. Great. I don't care if it's a tarball. I don't care if it's from SVN. I don't care if it fell off the moon. Yeah, cool. It, it does that well, I guess. But here's where it gets interesting. So I'll run through this, git dash C, go in this directory. Yep, okay, fine. Log. Log is very interesting. I went with reverse order. Uh, what did I just format for the syntax? Oh, for dtrace, I formatted the output syntax. So you've got your like Unix timestamp, a Unix date. Ooh, I know Unix. Uh, the hash and the summary. Okay, well, let's clean that up. So we, we jump into this branch. We start at the beginning of that branch, such as create the stable 13 branch as our first entry. Thank you, Ed Mast, for NL. No, that's not Netherlands. That is like, just make a list out of it. 
Okay, start at zero. Okay, you said to chop off a leading space or two and throw in some tabs, which are these funny characters here, and slam them into a source log. What you get is a numbered list with an Unix epoch date stamp, which is totally parsable and translatable and malleable. That uh, god awful hash. Maybe you could use a shorter one. I, gee, are they truly global? I don't know, but fine. That's a get thing. And then the summary. This is superhuman readable. This is human and machine readable. Well, human insofar as I recognize it and I know what to do with it. This is really human readable. That puts Git on my terms. Cool. This is suddenly really useful, and these log operations are fast. That I like about Git. So that, I hope, makes up for some sins that Git commits. And yeah, go check the, you can put in the link, the, the dummy man page generator, command generator. It's funny, because it's somewhat true. So jumping forward, for years, fortunately, there's not like a 13.0 thing. There's been meta mode, and here's how you do it. And I, I knew about it for a long time, and I finally started using it because I had a really pressing use case. You load a kernel module. You throw this flag into your build, and off you go, which means you create, you do a build world, a build kernel, you name it. The next time you do that, it looks for what's changed in the source tree and just skips all the stuff that hasn't changed. And funny, when you're following a branch, not much changes with one commit. So uh, that is your friend, and I will use the heck out of it shortly. So some of you may have bumped into my crappy sabbatical project, which was up.bsd LV during this pandemic. It's like, okay, fine. Free BSD update. Let's let's track a any branch, a stable branch, a a main head current branch, you name it. So thank you, Connor Bay, for helping pound through this. And yes, I figured out how to use Collins FreeBSD update figured out how to put everything in place to build releases, to update, to make it make it available. It really didn't help that the project switched to Git in the middle of it. Like, okay, so all the time to, that was going to go to improving it went to like just accommodating Git. Fine, but that was really educational and gave us those few slides a second ago. Uh, out of that came a tool you're welcome to try, this absolute beast of a build script that takes in like architecture with a flag, uh, the exact architecture, branch, you name it, and does everything to pull it in, build it, barf it out. You can tinker with it, but the components of that have been more useful, and they will show up shortly. Too long, didn't read. FreeBSD update is not FreeBSD upgrade. It, yes, how we've always done it. However, it was just designed for taking patch levels and building them and applying them. And great, but when it came time to upgrading a system, it is really not the way to go. <laughs> Try interrupting an upgrade and you'll find out exactly how viscerally that is a, a statement. So a touch more reflection. Uh, FreeBSD update did its thing, does its thing, okay, fine. But however, when Colin made it, it came prior to meta mode builds. It came prior to reproducible builds. It, com it came prior to OpenZFS. It came prior to Git. And the logging I just mentioned, it came prior to like, oh my gosh, powerful epic CPUs. And it came prior to the ransomware ap epidemic, which will actually play into this. Uh, Colin, I am mildly disappointed you didn't produce a proof of concept on at least three of these because you are an amazing developer who have produced some amazing things. But hey, uh, you're forgiven. Other kind people stepped up and made them. So uh, in the big picture, there's Package space. At one point, I heard of six different possible implementations, one of which is a joke. I look forward to it. And for all that uh, build option housekeeping and hygiene I mentioned earlier, I'm sure it serves that purpose. So, hey, it's all good. So let's reflect a little. What if when you use like FreeBSD update for an upgrade, you, you start with a DVD ISO. It's like, what? <laughs> and then you, you pull it apart. You build stuff a few times. You run through a bunch of steps. You security sign it. You do all this. I'm like, oh, okay, as, as Alan would put it, nope it from orbit, which is an aliens reference, bless your heart. And so, well, whoa, whoa, okay, so what if builds are cheap, like really cheap, like crazy cheap thanks to meta mode, you name it, uh, reproducible build. So it's like, oh, we're, we're following a branch and we want to see what's different. Well, if, if everything is as binary identical as possible, except for the thing you changed in that one commit, well, embrace that. 
And open ZFS is not the subject of this talk, but wow, it's powerful. It has things like, oh, snapshots. It has diff. It has all kinds of good stuff, which makes build really cheap. So what if you take meta mode, you take reproducible builds, you take open ZFS, and you just funnel it all together? And you slam it in Epic, and you use, say, Occam BSD, so you can build world in like one minute, 30 seconds. You can build a kernel in like seven seconds. And you can iterate for testing really quickly in ways that were not possible. When I sat down to FreeBSD first, people spent like every night building and then installing. And wow, it's like that can't be the most efficient way. So, well, that was then. This is now. Git navigation makes branch navigation really fast. Open ZFS makes immutability really cheap and again dynamic. You don't have to like unmount your root file system or uh, umount dash uh, uw root and stuff like from single user mode and all that. That's all gone. That's then. And things like uh, uh, flags and CRSSG, it's like, wait, oh, you want these few files to be immutable? How about you just make the entire data set immutable? It's, it's free. It's great. It's awesome. And of course, ransomware, if you look at ransomware mitigation, the number one suggestions are stay up to date and like make things uh, immutable because, hey, it's hard to encrypt stuff that you can't read. So that's been a good motivator. You can catch my SNEA talk this month on that topic and ZFS. But looking at all this, stepping back, snapshot every commit on a branch. ZFS don't care. It'll handle that. Snapshot meta mode as you go. ZFS don't care. Diff and clone each of those build tools don't care. Rsync binary diff is actually kind of useful and probably call in binary diff. So let's see, what if you had a read-only kernel data set and a binary data set like bin, s bin, you name it, libraries that are all from upstream? ZFS don't care, it'll do it. And uh, what if you were even to slam the binary results into Git? Git don't care, throw it into SVN. SVN don't care, and wow, there's a tool for checking out SVN in base. What do you know? Well. So that all said, I've put these together as a workbench for building a golden image based on a branch and stepping through every commit, how, however far you want to go. You've got the immutability when you need it. You've got deltas and diffs where you need them. In line with my terrible project names, I've called it Petri BSD because it's like a Petri dish where you kick that off, you create a golden image. You create a virtual machine image. You do a ZFS send from one to the other. I still have some boot issues to work out about how exactly you hand off. And there are countless ways in FreeBSD, which is actually really cool. You hand off from a kernel booting to, say, what is hopefully a mounted data set. But if it's missing certain components, it's not mountable. So there are advantages to be had there. But actionable on GitHub, I uploaded it last night. Actually, technically this morning, have at it. You, I, I, it's a bit rough, but once you see what's going on there, uh, go crazy. As for listing snapshots, I've seen systems with 20,000 empty snapshots. The FS don't care. It may take time, but it'll do it correctly. It's not like it'll tip over. So, whew, got it. Uh, yes, you could follow the entire free BSD or operating system of choice history from day one. It would be inefficient. Doing it on branches is wickedly quick. It's all good. It's all good. So seriously, thank you. Uh, that's a little of what I've been up to. And this talk has technically been in, in production since 2003 when I first sat down at jail and discovered build options. Uh, I, gear, I miss all the languages of everyone speaking, but hey, you can you help pick, pick your thanks there. But seriously, without EuroBSD Con, I wouldn't have gone down this road and this, I hope you find, is absolutely all actionable, and I hope you learned something. So thank you so much. I am totally happy to answer questions both here and now or possibly in the social contraption or offline. Clap, clap, clap. Thank you. <laughs> Achoo. <laughs> yeah, love a good eye. OK, uh, organizers. Tell me what's next. I'm happy to stick around. It's morning here. Hey, you're probably all tired. Now I got to kick the coffee with my Bob, daughter's Bob Ross cup. It's finally kicked in. I'm like, oh, let's rock and roll. And for the social event, I've got my art bag, Anoa. Got my 
Asia BSD Con Cup, and maybe I should have a little small, tiny celebration, even though it's morning here. Tiny bit of that. Sorry to miss the social event. Sorry to miss all the things. You're welcome, Tom. I don't know if you can hear me. I can't hear you, but hey, um, I hope you're grabbing the chat because I think there were some links here. There's a spatial. Well, isn't that spatial? Um, you can't hear us because we're all staying muted. Oh, geez. Well, I'm happy to talk. And you are welcome to join the same space tomorrow when Chuck and I will present on SMART, a permissively licensed SMART data utility for BSCs and ZFS and other fun things. Oh, Domagoy, hello, Jan, hello, Tom. I want to see all of you in person. Ah, Rick, I saw Henning did a great intro. Aw. Seriously, any questions? You're all just saying, hey, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Michael, check the shared notes tab. Ooh, a new thing. So, so my... My test thing was like a minute long somehow because time zones. And thank you, Renee, for doing that. It was better than nothing. And thank you, Chuck, for explaining. Oh, here we go. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm so sorry. Which hypervisor? Yeah. Um. There's Zen. There's Beehive, of course. And uh, uh, if you need nesting, I say just use uh, KVM on even like Ubuntu on ZFS. Go for it. Or Proxmox. Go for it. You can nest. Uh, techniques for isolating a dying fan. Um, unplug it, replace it. Um, check your temperatures. Uh, someone mentioned. I think the question was how to figure out which fan is the one that's making the Ooh. squealing noise. Yeah. Hopefully I've... that is. Um, well, if you're lucky, obvious. Uh, going low no. tech. Remember, a UPS is not always a computer component. Automotive folks have a little ear thingy on a hose that has a a little tube. Yeah, you can you can fashion one of those out of just uh, a piece of paper. Roll up a piece of paper in a cone shape and try to yeah. use it to literally as a a, <clears throat> a sound funnel. And it, sure. it it's amazing how even to figure out which hard drive is clicking in an array of hard drives, it can really help narrow it down. I, I was thinking of maybe ordering a stethoscope or something, but yeah, yeah the that can help. You know, car mechanics use that's a good idea. Sometimes it's obvious uh, if a fan blade is missing or something like that. <laughs> no, it's, um, I've, got, but I've got a bearing that's starting. If it's a bearing, there's a good chance you one of the RPM readings will be uh, by a 100 RPM off. Not yet, <clears throat> but I can sure hear it. I've answered the third question directly. Why not? Um, so, yeah, you want to use it M.2 or or U.2 NVMe device on an older system, there are PCI cards that adapt them, and you, your BIOS might not support it, but your OS generally will, so you just use it as log, use it as your high-speed VM storage, go for it, and it they they worked well for me. I'll leave it at that. Uh, builds faster, yeah, nested virtualization. Uh, Beehive, by consensus, probably will never have nesting because it's a whole lot of extremely difficult, complicated stuff that doesn't necessarily get much value. It lets you have, say, uh, de under development environment, but most people don't need that. So I say, as I mentioned, use KVM. Why not do it? Use, I think Beehive was mostly developed on VMware Fusion on a Mac in a cafe. So bless your heart, Peter, that was awesome. Um, Zen has absolutely rudimentary nested virtualization to host Zen on Zen. And I think uh, Hyper-V can support Hyper-V on Hyper-V to a point. Um, I don't know, use jails. I mean, look at Podrier has now has image and I think it was Daniel or someone suggested, hey, why not put Occam BSD as a provider there? Well, I see they just grab a source.com, so generate it externally, slam it in, uh, go with the Podrier image build and off you go. So. Jails and but um bum nested jails or even jails and virtual machines are absolutely your friend. Um, I didn't want to pound home the point that my talk on on isolated build environments is very much where this has all been headed over the years. And yeah, that was vaporware, but now the components are in place to, at the moment, 
build aggressively like crazy, but you probably need to build on a previous version of the OS, which might work in a jail, or it might be a virtual machine building for the purpose of another virtual machine. And ooh, ooh, ooh. So there is a blog post or two on how to build FreeBSD under, say, Linux and Mac OS. There is FreeBSD com Linux compatibility. Has anyone built FreeBSD under Linux compatibility and the build compatibility? I would be very curious. Uh, package base, I tried a snapshot. It was it, it installed and someone is has an unofficial repo, which is kind of cool, where uh, you can apparently track it. I, uh, I don't have a URL handy, but it might not be hard to find. Uh, I've been asking for years at conferences, and hey, I, I hope that's the future. Oh, and on, on package base, of all the weirdness of Red Hat 5.2, which at least matched the documentation, I love the fact that everything's accounted for through packages for the base system. So literally from the framework of files on up, it's all in a package. I'm like, that's great. So yeah, maybe we can have that too. I've only tried it once. Boom. Uh, public chat. Oh, so chat and shared notes are separate, so you have to hop between them. Okay. Yes. But I've you. seen people successfully do the build FreeBSD from Linux using the the stuff that's out there now. Under FreeBSD uh, Linux Compat? Oh no, uh, but on actual Linux, uh, oh, yeah. it's just the, having the the packages or whatever the the Python right. stuff to to replace to build enough of the FreeBSD tools to build FreeBSD with the tools it expects. That is something that could use some documentation love because there might be some use cases that really aren't obvious. So, hey, uh, I think that's a, a nifty, cool possibility. It's like it's, yes, sick and twisted and counterintuitive, but at least it validates all the components and validates that the build is working. And in the course of all this, I think, uh, Auditing the base system is a lovely future talk for somebody. Uh, is when are, and this came up on a call this week, uh, what is supported for um, static building of base? Yeah, okay, maybe PAM needs its modules and can't be built, but what can be and what should be but is broken. So yeah, there's rescue and we know that works, but there are other components that have been throwing me some really weird errors, such as a libc thing in ZFS and some dump utility, some bizarre thing. So NFS root is important. I realized if much of the pain from NFS is from all these like uh, CSHRG, whatever flags and flags, if you're using ZFS and you can do immutability for like free, uh, maybe we can just turn off all that legacy. That's how we used to do it. Functionality with special flags. Ooh, and quick tip LS dash O, I believe LO was, will show you the flags and I, that's a nice grab bag one I should have thrown in there. I learned that this week. Thank you all. And so just, wow, conferences are awesome. These have, if it's not obvious, been little side projects, proof of concepts, you name it, that have been sitting, spinning on a drive for years. And this forced me to dust them off, polish them up. They Some are more rough than others. I will admit that. But get them out there. And GitHub isn't perfect, but it it. It's what people are using, and I look forward to moving on to the next thing, whatever it might be. Other questions? You've got me. It's morning. It's Saturday. Chat, shared notes. Boom. And how are we on time? I have never once, confession, I've never once looked at the time for practicing a talk or planning a talk or anything. And yes, I've gone a bit late on some EuroBSD con, uh, Asia BSD con ones. My apologies. But often there's a break, and Often there's time until the social event, so no one will complain. I'm going to look at the list of attendees. Your time was uh, up 22 minutes ago. <laughs> oh, man, I'm so it's sorry. Okay. You can no, vote with your uh, feet. Get the heck out of here, but I'm happy to talk to you. Oh, I miss all yeah, of these. Yeah, there's sorry, nothing. No. Uh, the social event's starting in a couple minutes, and so I think we'll move over to the spatial chat or whatever. Is it purely spatial, or is part of it BBB? Um, I don't know it's... for sure. Spatial only, as far as I can tell. Cool. Okay, that's a neat tool. Um, that that's clever. It's a good uh, attempt to solve the problem. And oh, it's a problem. I'm stuck 
you're far away from all of you and can't like buy anyone a beverage. <laughs> ah, but hopefully come what? BSD cans of consensus? Maybe we'll be in person? Maybe? Possibly? It's a wait and see right now. Of course. Was that Adam Thompson? You've been that was, on yes. Twitter. How are you? I miss you. I'll mm. leave it at that. <laughs> I, I, too, would much rather be doing this in person. Hopefully, we'll be able to do that next year. Hopefully. What's funny is that it meant my preparation was, well, longer than ever and deeper than ever. So it's a, a whole bunch of actionable code that you're welcome to go poke at rather than some ideas. So, hey, I hope. Question for the chat. Did anyone learn something in this? <laughs> was I successful? Yeah, so the like Git stuff was interesting. Uh, different than the one I wrote for you, which was, you know, who was the last one to touch each file in this directory? That's next. Yes, totally. That is that that. Once I realized the power of log, it's like, oh, okay. That yes, thank you, Alan. I yeah, will. especially when it has that dash dash format where you can choose what to output and be like, oh, I want a CSV that I can stuff into a, a thing. It's like I want to show me a list of of all the commits. Between this, like you can also uh, give it date ranges. Say every commit after this date and before this date, and then be like, you know, uh, only the ones that contain these words. Like um, you can do git log with I think dash dash grep, and you say only ones that contain this keyword in it somewhere. So nice. you can basically grep the commit log, uh, but in a format that you can parse, like you were doing. And there's all kinds of other filters you can add. So looking back, Git is a source code database and happens to have source code management bolted on and does some stuff. But hey, uh, like I said, I, I want a tree. It, I don't care how it got there. However, those tools are really useful. I guess if you haven't seen it, are you familiar with the Git work tree subcommand? Ooh, no. Okay, so if you have a Git clone of the FreeBSD source code or whatever, sometimes you want to work on more than one thing at once. So if you do Git work tree and add some name and then the name of a branch, it will check that out as a subdirectory in your current checkout. Ooh, okay. And so you can have four different projects going at once on different branches, um, and but they all share the same .git directory, so you don't you know, waste the space of having four whole Git checkouts or, you know, when you pull in newer code, it's available on all of them and you don't have to. So like my, my checkout of the ZFS one has like nine work directories with different projects <laughs> going on in them. Totally. Uh, or it's even just handy to be able to have a checkout of, you know, uh, main as well as stable 13 and stable 12 or whatever. Uh, I will share one Git thing that burned me twice this morning, and I mean like late night morning. So uh, don't do this. Don't create a new GitHub repo and commit to it. Probably any repo, but I happen to be using GitHub. Make your initial commit. Realize, oh, I meant to rename that file. So you just like revert, and then you go in to rename a file, and everything's gone. Like, oh, thank you, Git. So fortunately, uh, get like, ref log uh, yeah. Yeah. will let you get back to before you reverted and so on. I'm glad they kept that. And the the I th intuitively I thought the revert would be like go back in time, nuke the current one. Well, no, 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 it didn't do that. And everything I was working on vanished until I realized, yeah, it's still stuck in there. So I retrieve it out and out of spite, nuke the repo. But yeah, um, uh, uh, that is worthy of a blog post of just don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, you'll, you'll, you'll cry, <laughs> especially at like 2 a.m. about to give a talk on that very subject and want to get some code that's actionable out to your friends and colleagues. Okay. The, as with every mobile interface, the interface for that, uh, social chat is good, but not great. I found that like closing it logged me out, but I'll try it. I'll jump on social. Um, well, uh, okay. doing it with the computer seems to work better. And then okay, you can drag cool. your head around. And um, it, it's, it works really nice as a hallway track because there's different areas. And the people you're standing beside are louder. And you can move away and talk to other people. And it's uh, 
instead of having, you know, four breakout rooms, you kind of get this more organic feel of being able to wander around and listen to what people are talking about without, you know, randomly jumping in a room or whatever. I'll try it. I admit I'm a little saddle sore from this thing, but that's okay. <laughs> and yes, I'm sore, but I do the downside to the uh, saddle seat, I suppose. Yes, indeed. Anyway, oh, here we go. Oh, what's, no, I did try a desktop. What's with it saying, here's your plugin for your browser? It's like, oh, I don't want to, no. I, I didn't, I never said that. that? Looks, step one, step two, continue. Like, I uh, know I don't want that. What browser are you using? Uh, this thing called Chrome. And in fact, it's an Iridium fork, so the plugin might oh, not even work. I wish I'm, I could I'm just using plain Chrome on Windows, and it uh, let me in without any questions about plugins. Okay. Well, let's see if it lets me get past it. Uh, try again. Okay, so, oh, it shows me into the browser store. Whatever. Not, uh, I, no need to bore you with that. Anyway, it's been a pleasure, and I'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning at the same time and evening for you. Um, uh, it's still ah. morning for me, just not as early as you. <laughs> Did you have any other West Coast speakers? Um, I don't know. I, I had my talk and then enough time to eat and then uh, moderating for your talk. Cool. How did the home lab stop go if it hasn't gone Quite good. tomorrow? Uh, yeah. No, it was this morning. Um, Mikey couldn't make it, but we got Tom Jones to fill in. Cool. Uh, a couple of bits of overlap about the, you know, the concept of careful your stuff in your home lab doesn't mix in with the production stuff. You know, turns out there are services you run in your home lab that suddenly people depend on. If you, you, if you break the app that makes the TV work, then yeah. uh, people will complain at you. <laughs> This is true. Which one, sir? Cool. Uh, how much storage? Uh, Very cool. That's clever. I mean, that's clever. Yeah. I like that. That's, um, that's clever. I'll, I'll go with mobile so I can also move around the house. And I was like helping my wife load some wax into a thing like during that talk. And that's why I'm like, good idea, Jan. Um, awesome. I miss you. I can't emphasize right. that enough. See you over there. Cool. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope you learned something.